Michelle, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm so excited. This sounds like such a fun series and I'm happy to be a part of it. Love it. Let's start at the beginning of your journey. How old were you when you fell in love with soccer and what was it that drew you to the sport? I mean, I definitely got into the sport because just my family being Nigerians, I think soccer or football, they would say, is is everything to them. And so my um, the youngest of four, so all of my siblings played soccer. So I just blindly went into it just because it was what they were doing. And I just had to copy them since I was the baby. Um, but I don't think it was maybe until I was like around 10 where I actually like loved it just for the sport itself instead of doing it because my siblings did it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of when I started to take it a little bit more serious and wanted to, you know, see how far things could take me. Yeah. Did you ever imagine that you would be doing this professionally? I mean, at the time, I I think the professional women's leagues in America just kept folding. Um, so all I kept seeing was it folding in America. So I wasn't necessarily sure how I would be professional, if there was going to be a professional league, um, if I would have to go overseas to, to play football. Um, and so I think obviously as I continued to grow, um, the league here also continued to grow and be a little bit more established. And um, it wasn't until maybe around college where I realized I couldn't really go professional here in the States with it and just to see how far I can take it. I know it wasn't a straight path to the professional <clears throat> stage for you. There's a quote that says, if opportunity doesn't knock, create your own door. And you've done that. Um, you had a couple of doors closed in your face before you got there, but ultimately a couple of emails that you had sent out led to tryouts. So can you talk about your opportunities with the Houston Dash and the Nigeria, Nigerian national team? How did they come about? Yeah, thankfully, I, I literally give her so much credit for this, but my old teammate, my old club teammate that I've known since I was maybe 13, um, I reached out to her because she was in Houston and she told me to email some of the head coaches um, in the league and particularly the one in Houston. So she gave me the emails for them and the assistant coaches. I sent them an email just asking for an opportunity. I had my sister living here in Houston, so I was able to just crash on their couch. So it was going to be at like no extra expense to them, like just allow me to have a chance really. And um, thankfully they allowed me to join and really it's just been um, history since then. And I've been with them for three years now. So really thankful and grateful for that opportunity and kind of just like, you know, believing in myself and, and taking a chance on myself and allowing them to also see what potential I had. That's amazing. Fast forward <laughs> to the World Cup this past summer, Nigeria was eliminated in the round of 16, but you were a significant part of the team's success. What was your experience playing in the World Cup like and what do you remember most? Man, playing in the World Cup was surreal, honestly. And I think even leading up to it, once the roster came out, it came out maybe like a month or so before um, we went out to Australia, but it still just didn't hit me. I remember so many people asking me like how I felt or like what I was feeling. And I think it was just like a shock factor just because obviously the World Cup is something we've I've been watching since I was a kid, um, both the women's and the men's. So actually having an opportunity to be there just didn't seem real, um, especially since like I couldn't get on a soccer team two years ago. And so now to be at the World Cup with one of the best um, African teams in, in Africa is like, what, like what is going on? Like, it just like didn't really hit me. Um, but I'm just so proud of the group that, that we went with. Um, I think that a lot of people counted us out, especially being on the quote unquote group of death. And, um, I think we also grew a really big fan base from people who weren't Nigerian um, after beating um, Australia and tying with Canada and then tying with Ireland and putting up such a good show versus England. And I think no one really expected that from us, but it allowed us to also grow um, a lot and show the growth of Africa soccer and obviously Nigeria as well. Yeah, for sure. You talked about that shock factor. Did you have kind of a pinch me moment during the World Cup? And if so, can you describe it? Yeah, I think it was <laughs> so stupid, but it was definitely when um, we had our media day and they were just like asking us questions and having us put on our different uniforms and like they were like sending us photos and they're like, this is what this is going to be for. And this is like headlining for FIFA. And I was just like, like, what is going on? Like, I just feel like a little celebrity. Like, this is literally just like a dream of mine, like my childhood dream, like just was so fulfilled. And I felt like I was able to kind of like close 
um, a really important chapter from my childhood from that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was definitely just doing media and, and doing silly things with the team and answering questions for FIFA. Um, that was like, a oh, okay, I'm actually here in Australia. <laughs> Our game is in two days. Like, okay, like we're here, <laughs> we're doing this. <laughs> I love that. You're obviously Nigerian by blood. Can you talk about what it was like growing up in a Nigerian household as a first uh, generation American? Yeah, I think I remember kind of really discussing this in, in college, actually, with um, other first gen Americans. I think it was just like kind of a state of confusion growing up. Like you kind of feel like you're split between two cultures, really. And um, I remember being kind of like almost embarrassed to be African or to be Nigerian and like to smell like the cuisine or to have my parents have the accent, which now I think is just so silly. But um, I remember it just being a, a little tough for me um, trying to kind of like appease both cultures or try to uh, appeal to both cultures. Um, and now like I feel so sad that I was ever embarrassed of like my parents' accents or like smelling like a goosey soup or something like when it's really so good and everyone wants to try it now. But um, I remember it definitely being tough and kind of uh, me not necessarily understanding why you know, it was so hard to be a part of two cultures um, at the same time. Yeah. What is your full Nigerian name and what does it mean? Yeah, my, my name is Michelle Chiwendu Alozia and Chiwendu means um, God owns life. And I think I, I really like show that with, you know, the opportunities that I'm trying to make for myself or I'm making for myself and just like sticking to it. And like you said, when opportunities aren't, aren't available, you have to make them. And I think that God is doing that with me like daily um whether i see it or not um so i think i live by my name for sure my parents did good with that <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's beautiful a moment ago you just talked about um wanting to hide your nigerian roots growing up and i can totally mm -hmm. resonate with that why yeah. do you think it felt so embarrassing back then and what changed for you i mean i think probably like i don't know if i grew up in a pretty small town so I don't know if people were just a little xenophobic at the time, but just being different was just so not okay. And I think I remember just having like a baby identity crisis when I was younger, when people were like, oh, you've never like been to a barbecue or your family doesn't like have like cookouts or something. And I'm like, no, but like once a, once a month, the emo population in San Diego will get together and have like this big party and we all are dressed up and we're meeting all these people and they're like, what are you like, what are you doing? Like you, this shouldn't, this doesn't sound right. But I think it was just the fact that I was just so different and it was a part of a culture that a lot of people weren't exposed to, especially in my small town in California. Um, and it was just hard for them to understand that like, yes i am black and i do live in america and i do have an american accent but like my actual culture is nigerian so i just have a like my upbringing what we do in the home is completely different than what your black american friends do mm -hmm. um and i think obviously when we were younger that was just a little bit difficult for people and myself really to come to grasp with but again i don't think it was until really college when i finally met friends who weren't like my family members but just genuine friends um who were also first gen and they all kind of um, had the same experiences as me growing up um whether it be they're in new york or in florida or charlotte um and so i didn't feel alone and then um it kind of just made me feel a little bit at ease and not feel as bad for you know 10 year old me being embarrassed of my parents because we like all were um but um yeah i think that was kind of the turning point for me yeah. Yeah. You still wanted to play from Nigeria from when you were a small kid. So what made you want to play professionally and represent the motherland? Um, I think really just like having the pride that I had to be Nigerian and finally breaking through with that in college. Um, I have this funny photo actually of me like in the Super Eagles jersey from 2015. And I told myself if I am not on the Nigerian national team in four years, like something's gonna be wrong. So I think a lot of people kind of had that mis misconception that I wanted to be on the US or I'm only on Nigeria because I didn't make it to the US, but mm -hmm. the US was like never the end goal for me. It was always to, you know, rep being from Nigeria, make my parents proud, um, make my family back in Nigeria proud and allow them 
to, you know, live vicariously through me through this dream that we've all had, which is playing for um, Nigerian repping our country. Yeah, you kind of just touched on it a little bit, but how much pride do you have in getting to represent Nigeria? What does that mean to you? It is, it is literally everything. And I think it didn't hit me until obviously I got my call up um, in 2021 mm -hmm. and, you know, just like calling my parents and letting them know. And they were just like so shocked and having all my uncles and aunts call me. It was just like so surreal. And it made me so happy that, you know, they were like, even though I was born in America and <clears throat> I only had been to Nigeria like once in my life before that, that I would want to represent the family mm -hmm. and represent our culture and show, you know, just the pride that I have in being Nigerian. Um, but yeah, Nigerian pride is strong, that's for sure. And I think I've definitely grown into that pride um, as I've gotten older, but I'm definitely at peace with where I am. You mentioned your parents and your your family members, your uncles. What do you think that it means to them that you got to represent Nigeria? Yeah, I mean, I, they love it. They love it. I think they're all just so confused at how this like little one who was just falling <laughs> in her siblings' footsteps made it to the Nigerian team. Um, but they're just so happy. They always, you know, take credit. They're like, oh, remember when we were doing those shooting drills, like in San Diego in your backyard, like that's the reason you're on Nigeria. I'm like, yeah, that, is, that actually is the reason, you know? So um, any opportunity I have just to, you know, make them proud, allow them to come to one of our games or something like that. Um, it just makes me uh, so happy. And I feel like it really fulfills the family. For people that don't know, what kind of sacrifices did your parents make? What are some hardships that Nigerian immigrants face that people don't necessarily see? Yeah, I mean, my parents came um, in their like mid 20s to come to college. At first, my mom was in Canada, my dad was in Texas. And so, I mean, their whole focus, which I think we also forget when we're younger, is like their whole focus is to like bring their family to America as well, because they were the first to come to America um, on both sides. So their whole focus was to make it su successfully, get some money, um, and either send it back home or allow for their family to come. Mm -hmm. And I think as they're doing that, they're also just trying to figure out their life. They're trying to, you know, make life for us as um, as amazing as um, they can and obviously have different opportunities that they weren't allowed to have in Nigeria or they fought really hard to then come to America for. Um, and so I think that, you know, the mistakes I'm allowed to make when I'm 25 or 26 right now, they were not trying to make any mistakes then. They had to be like completely perfect. They weren't allowed to, you know, kind of like, I'll just play soccer right now. Like I'll figure out my life later and maybe med school, maybe this later. They like had to have a really strict plan because it wasn't just them that they're kind of worried about. It was their whole entire family that they're trying to, you know, make life better for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just amazing because me being 25 right now, I still feel like I'm a kid. And for them to have moved to a different country, trying to make life for their whole entire family better and bring them to America. Like, I just can't imagine doing that at my age. And they were, so. Yeah, yeah. that's a really, really nice way of putting that. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. sharing that. What are some <laughs> things from your culture that have turned you into the person and player that you are today? Ooh. Um... I would honestly definitely say the worth ethic. Um, I think, I mean, that's like a really good stereotype that, that Nigerians have is that they will work and work tirelessly and endlessly to get what they want. And I think that I have done that throughout my scholastic career and also now my professional career. Like I've just, I will put work into everything just to make sure that things come into fruition the way I see it. Um, regardless of me not sleeping or me missing this or me missing that or me missing someone's wedding, like I will do what I have to do to make sure that something works out um, the way that I see it working out to be. Yeah, there's a saying, Nija no de carry last. Have you heard Ever. that before? Yes. <laughs> what does that mean to you? Can you explain kind of what that means for people that don't get it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just that regardless of what we're doing, regardless of what situation we're in, like we will not, we will not be trampled on. We will not, you will like never catch a slip in. Like Nigeria will always come, will come prideful, will come right, will come with receipts. We will come like <laughs> with everything prepared to be the best. Um, and we always 
think we're also the best too, which also <laughs> helps. But, um, you know, we'll always like come on top at the end of whatever situation that we're in. I've heard you talk about the fight of the Nigerian national team. How does that saying kind of spill over into the Super Falcons work ethic? Yeah, I mean, I haven't even, I've only been on the Nigerian team now for, this is going into my third season. Mm -hmm. And just to hear what they have put themselves through from such a young age, there's people that have been on the team for 20 years plus. And just to see that they have been able to triumph so much and work for so much, I think a lot of people obviously don't see things that happen behind the scenes. Um, and so with the Super Falcons, it's way more than just, you know, performing on the field. We have to do so much behind the scenes that people don't really know or, or we can't really talk about. Um, and so and just to see that they're able to kind of go through these things um, off the field and yet still perform and have so much pride to just rep their family, rep Nigeria and just like bring some type of pride or happiness to a country um who you know may not be so happy right now or like maybe dealing with something else football always brings so much pride to pride and happiness to nigerians and so i think for them to you know put everything aside and still being able to perform um and perform their hearts out literally blood sweat and tears um just to make others happy shows that our work ethic um to the t i think i love that what is the overall team dynamic like Oh, it's so funny. I think mean, when when I first joined it, oh, I was so confused. Um, and, you know, like, you know, some of them wanted us to call them aunties and stuff. And I was like, whoa, what is this? What You're my teammate. Um, but after getting to, like, you know, um, meet them and getting to know them a little bit, they're all just so kind and friendly and they genuinely want the best for you. Having had the opportunity to represent Nigeria at the World Cup and get a taste of, you know, playing on the world's biggest stage, what would having the opportunity to represent Nigeria at an Olympic Games mean to you? Oh, yeah, the Olympics would be insane. To put it into, in, into um, respect, the Nigerian team hasn't made it to the Olympics since 2008, I believe. And so although we've made it to every World Cup, it's for some reason, it's the Olympics that um, seems to hinder us a bit. So one, to just have the Super Falcons back into the Olympics would be amazing. But also, again, after having such an amazing run in the World Cup, mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, put on a performance again in the Olympics um, would be amazing. And again, just show the gap that is closing between what everyone says is like the best soccer from like Europe or the Americas and show that, you know, African soccer is really um, closing that gap. Soccer and Nigerian culture is just one portion of your life. You got mm -hmm. your undergraduate degree from Yale in molecular, cellular and developmental biology with the dream of becoming a cardiologist. How did that dream come about? I mean, actually, from a young age, I was obsessed with animals, and I, like, really, really just wanted to work with animals, so I wanted to be a veterinarian, mm -hmm. and I remember telling my parents that, and they were like, you're not going to be a veterinarian, like, if you want to, like, help, help, like, animals, help humans, they're animals, too, and you can be a doctor, and I was like, oh, okay, like, I can be a doctor, and so <laughs> I just, like, always kind of enjoyed biology, that was always my favorite subject in school, mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of just seemed like a no-brainer. Um, at the end of my senior year, I ended up working um, with a cardiovascular and therapeutics lab um, for my senior thesis, and mm -hmm. just working with um, that lab, the Dardic lab, um, I just learned that this was like a really fun niche um, field and that wasn't really populated one with women but or with the women of color. And so I thought that that would be an amazing place for me to, to be in. <laughs> when you're not playing soccer, you work as a cancer research technician at Texas Children's Cancer and Hematology Center. Can you explain what you do there? Yeah, so my lab um, with um, Dr. Alexander Stevens, um, alongside Dr. Riddell, we kind of work on, you know, chemotherapies and seeing how these new chemotherapies are able to, um, or how these different cancers are able to resist these chemotherapies and the best ways to give these chemotherapies um, 
in conjunction with another or just by themselves, how they'll be able to eradicate these patients' cancers. So I'm kind of more on a smaller base scale and hopefully with the research that we do, it's able to go to clinical research and then it would actually be be able to get to these patients who really need um, these chemotherapy drugs. That is amazing work that you're doing. Do you still plan on going to medical school when you're finished playing soccer professionally to be a cardiologist? I, yeah, I, I mean, I still have that passion for sure. I think being out of school for this long, it does make it a little wary, I will be honest. But I mean, I think just having, you know, being able to work with Dr. Stevens and Dr. Riddell and seeing the interactions they have with their patients and just how much they like care for them is something that I yearn for and I still like really want to do obviously in a different field but I think the the dream still maintains the same and even though I'll be 30 something in med school as a first year med school um but it, it'll just have to be hey it's never too late it's never I know too late. everyone always asks you how do you balance it all but I truly believe that if you love something enough you'll make it work so my question for you <laughs> is what keeps you going what keeps me going? I mean, I think it's just the genuine love that I have for doing both things. Like football has been just a love, a childhood love of mine. And so I like, I just can never give up that dream and can never give up or like stop myself um, early from doing that dream and fulfilling a childhood dream of mine. And then the medical field has kind of been a dream of my that's continuing to grow, but also just from me when I was older. So it's like my adult dream. And so since I have genuine love for both of these, like I'm willing to sacrifice the other things, like not really having vacation time or whatever, since I have to be full time at the hospital or, you know, like just not being able to like hang out with my friends too much since I have to like be at the fields, but also go to the hospital after. But I think it's just like all worth it just because I have genuine love and care for doing both of the things that I'm doing.